You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. There's a story from church history about a couple of guys who were headed somewhere one day when they encountered a man who was unable to walk from birth. The man who was unable to walk would sit on the side of the road every day begging for money. And as these two guys passed by on one particular day, the beggar asked them for some money. They checked their pockets. They didn't have any money. But they believed that Jesus wanted to heal this man. And so they stopped and in faith they instructed the lame man to get up and walk. At first the beggar didn't know what to do. No one had ever said anything like this to him before. But then one of the guys took the lame man by the hand and helped him get up. The story goes that in that moment the lame man's feet and ankles were healed. And suddenly, not only could he walk, but he could run and jump. As you can imagine, word spread quickly. And as people heard about what happened to this man, they wanted to meet the guys who had healed him. And so the crowd gathered around the two guys, and one of the guys started sharing the truth of the Gospel with them. He told them about how Jesus came. He, he told them about how Jesus lived a sinless life. He, told them about how Jesus had died to pay for their sin. After a little while, some of the city leaders got wind of what was going on. And when they got close to the crowd, they saw what was happening and they became angry. They became so angry that they had these two guys thrown in jail for the night. The next morning, the city leaders held a trial. They asked these two guys who who were responsible for the miracle, how they had done such a thing. In response, one of the guys spoke up and he started telling the city leaders about Jesus. He told them about how Jesus came to earth. He told them about how Jesus lived a sinless life. He told them about how Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sin. He told them if they would repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus, they could be reconciled to God, their Creator. The city leaders were in a difficult spot. Because if they put these guys back in jail, they would have a riot on their hands. But if they turned them loose to continue preaching about Jesus, they knew that half the city might end up converted. And so they decided they would let the guys go free. But before letting them go free, they gave them explicit instructions not to preach about Jesus anymore. Upon hearing the conditions for their release, one of the guys spoke up and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Maybe you figured out by now that this story from church history is a story from the Bible. You can find it in Acts chapter 3 and 4. The two guys were Peter and John. And Peter is the one who is recorded as doing all of the talking. He's the one who wrote the passage that we have in front of us this morning. And where we might like Peter's words in Acts 4, I have to think that we may not be too fond of his words in 1 Peter 2. But as we read, understand that both came from the same guy. The guy who said we must obey God rather than man also wrote this text under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to read 1 Peter 2 verses 13 through 17 for us this morning. Hear now the Word of God. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. 
honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to consider it, to come together as your people and to hear from you. Father, we pray that you would be our teacher this morning, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, that we would go from this place changed as a result of having been with you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You remember that last week we looked at our identity as sojourners and exiles. We were reminded that this world is not our home. That we are just passing through. That our true home is a house not made with hands. It is eternal in the heavens. But this morning, as we gather together as the people of God, we find ourselves not in heaven, but in Spotsylvania, Virginia, in the United States of America. And so the question then is, how do we live? Specifically, how do we relate to our earthly government as sojourners and exiles here? As citizens of another kingdom? You see, this was an important question that was on the minds of the Christians who were in Asia Minor, the recipients of this letter from the Apostle Peter. They were surrounded by pagans, they were living under an authoritarian regime led by an evil emperor named Nero. And so what should they do? How should they live? And that's the question that Peter addresses specifically in this section of the letter. And as we consider what Peter wrote to them then, we're going to observe three principles for how sojourners should relate to earthly governments. Three principles for how sojourners should relate to earthly governments. Here's the first one. Sojourners submit to government authority. Sojourners submit to government authority. Look at the exhortation there in verse 13. Peter writes, Be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. Now remember, verse 11, Peter has just identified his recipients as sojourners and exiles. And so hearing that, they may have thought, does this mean, if I'm a sojourner, if I'm an exile, if, if this world is not my home, does this mean that I don't have to submit to Nero? If this world is not my home, then maybe Nero isn't my emperor. You've heard of the hashtag or the chant, not my president. This is the pre-social media hashtag, not my emperor. But Peter quickly addresses any ideas that these Christians may have had that they didn't have to submit to the governing authorities who were over them. And so he writes, be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him. And I wonder when you hear that, does it make you kind of bristle up a bit. Be subject to every human institution. I think our obedience to Peter's instruction here has really been tested over the last several months. We've been given all kinds of commands and instructions from our government. Wear a mask when you go into a business. Uh, you, you have to social distance. You, you know, all of these instructions, all of these commands, no school, all of these things that we've been told to, to observe, and we've been kind of tested in our willingness to obey what Peter says here, be subject to every human institution. It, it kind of rubs us the wrong way, doesn't it, when Peter says this, be subject to every human institution. If I'm honest with you this morning, it kind of rubs me the wrong way. I don't, I don't want to submit to every human institution. And I think there are some, some reasons for that. Some reasons that we kind of bristle up when we hear that. I think one reason is that we're human, right? Human beings have been rebelling against authority ever since the Garden of Eden. We don't like anyone telling us what to do. And it starts early, doesn't it? My two-year-old has a bad habit when I tell him to do something of folding his arms and looking me in the eyes and saying no. And I won't tell you what happens after that. But the point is that we don't like authority, right? 
Because we're human. We're, and, and on top of that, not just that we're human, but we've been impacted by sin. We've inherited sin from the first rebels, Adam and Eve. But not only because we're human, I think also we don't like authority because we're Americans. Just as human beings have been rebelling against authority since the Garden of Eden, Americans have been rebelling against authority since before we were officially a country, right? Just ask the British. We don't want your tea or your king, right? I think also it's because of free speech. We love free speech, don't we? It's enshrined in the First Amendment to our Constitution. I'm benefiting from free speech right now. Free speech is, of course, not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. But it can help foster rebellion against authority. But I think another reason that we don't like authority is sometimes because of bad experiences with authority. Anyone here had a bad experience with authority? Maybe it was a parent, a pastor, a teacher, a boss at work, a police officer, whoever it may have been, most of us have had a bad experience with authority at some point or another. And so we don't like authority. We bristle up when we read, be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him. But notice a few words there that I left out in verse 13. Look, look at what Peter writes there. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, what does Peter mean by that? What does he, what does he mean when he says to, to be subject for the Lord's sake? What does he mean? He means that as Christians, we obey the governing authorities because of our submission to the Lord. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 13, Verses 1 and 2, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. You see, we don't submit to the governing authorities because the people in those positions are necessarily good leaders. Often they're not, right? We end up with with bad leaders sometimes. Remember, the emperor at the time that Peter wrote this was Nero. No, we submit not because our leaders are good, but because God is good. And there is no authority that has not been instituted by God. Therefore, to rebel against government authority is to rebel against God. Peter's inclusion of for the Lord's sake also implies that if the government authority tells us to do something that is Contrary to God's word, we obey God rather than man. We know that's exactly what Peter did in Acts 4, right? He said, you're telling me to do something, to stop preaching the gospel. This is contrary to what God has said. I can't do it. But let's not be distracted from Peter's focus here. Because his focus is not on the reality that there are some times when civil disobedience is good and right. Though that is true. His focus here is on the reality that generally... Christians should submit to the government authorities. Notice also the word every in Peter's exhortation. Peter writes, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. For Peter's original readers, that was the Emperor Nero. It was the governors under his charge. It was anyone else who was in a position of governing authority. But what about us? We don't have an emperor, but we do have a president. But we don't have the same kind of governors that they had in the Roman Empire in the first century, but we do have congressional leaders. Well, we do have a state government. We have a governor. We have a state legislature. We do have a local government, a board of supervisors, a school board. And Peter says to us this morning, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Peter then goes on to make clear the right role of government. Look at verse 14. First, to punish those who do evil, and also to praise those who do good. Well, we don't want the government treading on us, but the government does serve a legitimate, God-ordained purpose in society. 
We need laws that restrain evil. And we need laws that promote good. And the truth is that in our system of government in this country, we actually have the opportunity to guide our government in this direction. To help elect leaders who will punish evil and promote good. To write to our leaders and to encourage them to do the right thing. We, we, we guide our government in the right direction by voting. We do it by writing to our representatives to express our views. But we don't do it by organizing a coup. We don't do it by railing against our leaders. We hold them accountable in a respectful way that demonstrates that our ultimate allegiance is to God. We submit for the Lord's sake. So number one, sojourners submit to government authority. Number two, sojourners submit with a goal in mind. We're, we're not just mindlessly, blindly submitting. No, we have a goal. We have an intent behind our submission. We've already said that our submission is unto the Lord. and Peter mentions that again. He writes, for this is the will of God. You say, well, what is the will of God? The grammar is a little bit difficult here and the ESV translation can be a bit difficult. But I think it likely that Peter is saying that our submission to governing authorities is the will of God. It is the will of God that we would submit to the governing authorities over us. And so our goal in submitting to the governing authorities is that in doing so we would obey the Lord. But that's not the only goal that Peter mentions here. He gives another goal. He also says that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Peter is saying that when you as a Christian live as a good citizen by submitting to authority, brothers and sisters, you commend the gospel. People in the Roman Empire in Peter's day did not think too highly of Christians. They, they thought them to be weird. They, they thought them to have strange practices. People were generally suspicious of Christians. And that's not so unlike our day, is it? And so Peter says, be a good citizen. Submit to the authorities. Don't stand out for the wrong reason. Live in a way that commends your faith in Jesus. Let me give you a couple of examples. The first example that I'd point your attention to is not really about submission to government authority, but it is about acting in a way in the community that commends our faith in Jesus. You know that we have developed quite the relationship with Robert E. Lee Elementary. and You heard even this morning about our school supplies drive, that we're collecting school supplies for Robert E. Lee. And I could not be more thrilled about the ways in which our relationship with that school has grown. Not everyone, I want you to know, not everyone in this community likes the things that Goshen Baptist Church stands for. Not everyone in this community likes the things that we believe. But what they cannot deny is our genuine efforts to serve our community. As a church in this community, we want to conduct ourselves in a way that if Goshen Baptist Church was to close tomorrow, it would be a genuine loss for the community. That needs would go unmet that we are meeting. That people would notice that something was missing if we all of a sudden didn't exist anymore. We want our good deeds to put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now let me give you an example related to COVID-19. Back in March, uh, on March the 16th, our elders made the decision to suspend all in-person gatherings of Goshen Baptist Church. At that time, the governor had not yet told us that we couldn't meet, but that instruction came soon thereafter. And the truth is, we could have kept meeting, right? We could have ignored the guidance that was coming from the CDC. We could have thumbed our nose at the governor. But how would that have looked in our community in the midst of a pandemic? It would not have commended the gospel. Our neighbors would have looked at us and thought, those people care more about their freedom than they do the good of this community. And God forbid we have an outbreak here and end up on the front page of the Freelance Star for all the wrong reasons. There were certainly other reasons to close, like the health of our own congregation. 
but submitting to the government authorities and suspending in-person gatherings also serves to put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And oh, that we would keep this perspective always at the forefront of our minds, brothers and sisters. Let's determine to never intentionally do anything that would put a stumbling block in the way of our neighbors whom we desire to see come to faith in Jesus Christ. Because life in this world matters, but eternity matters infinitely more. And so as we live as sojourners and exiles, may we submit to government authority with the goal of being good citizens so that our submission will commend the gospel that we proclaim. Sojourners submit to government authority. Sojourners submit with a goal in mind. And number three, sojourners submit with a plan in place. And here's the plan. Verse 16, Peter says, Submit as people who are free. The English Standard Version says, Live as people who are free. The Christian Standard Bible translation is better here. It says, submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. It's interesting that Peter refers to his recipients as free people. They were not free in the sense that we are. The Roman Empire in the first century was certainly not like America. But they were free in Christ. They were free in Christ just as we are. Free from bondage to sin. Free to walk in righteousness before God. And so that's exactly what Peter calls them to do. He says, don't use your freedom as an excuse to sin. I like what Tom Schreiner says here. He says, genuine freedom liberates believers to do what is good. Those who use freedom as license for evil reveal that they are not truly free since a life of wickedness is the very definition of slavery. Christians should never respond to the dictates of government slavishly, but they should obey out of strength and because of their freedom. Now in verse 17, Peter gives four quick commands. First, he says, honor everyone. As followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters, we should treat everyone with honor and respect. It's interesting to me that this is the same word that Peter uses for the way that Christians should respond to the emperor. You honor the emperor, but Peter says honor everyone. Because we're not a people of partiality, we show honor to everyone. It doesn't matter your position, it doesn't matter how great you are, we're going to honor everyone. All people are created in the image of God with inherent dignity and worth. It doesn't matter how powerful they are. It doesn't matter how lowly they are. As followers of Jesus, we treat everyone with the honor and respect that they deserve as image bearers of God. It's especially important for us to remember when it comes to those we disagree with, isn't it? Because it's easy to honor those who share the same views and ideas as we do. That's easy. It's much harder to honor those who see things differently than we do. But Peter doesn't leave any wiggle room here, does he? He says, honor everyone. We honor everyone. But notice also that we have a special relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Peter says, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. As I said, it is when non-Christian... It, 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 as sad as it is when non-Christians dishonor and speak ill of one another, how much more tragic is it when brothers and sisters in Christ do not love one another? It's interesting that this instruction to love the brotherhood comes in the context of Peter's instruction concerning the Christian's response to civil government. Because I find in our day that one of the most divisive subjects among Christians is politics. People feel very strongly about their political allegiances. And I only wish that we felt as strongly about our allegiance first to our Lord and then to our brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, politics don't have to divide us as followers of Jesus. We have something much greater than politics that unites us. But we must commit ourselves to love the brotherhood. 
not only love the brotherhood, Peter says, fear God. Fear God. This is stronger than honor, right? We honor everyone. We love the brotherhood. But we don't fear anyone but God, right? We fear God. Our ultimate loyalty as followers of Jesus belongs to our God. And we, when we keep that in its proper perspective, the truth is that these other things kind of fall into place. Finally, Peter says, honor the emperor. And I think it's easy to honor our government leaders when we agree with their politics, isn't it? When we liked them, when we supported them, when we voted for them. It's easy to honor them. It's much more difficult when we disagree. The good thing about America is that we always have ample opportunity to put this instruction into place. Because there will always be government leaders that we don't like or that we don't prefer. Sometimes we will strongly oppose the things that our leaders stand for. But Peter doesn't give any caveats here. He says, honor the emperor. And remember that the emperor at the time was Nero. Now let me wrap this up with eight action steps that you can take in light of 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. It'll be quick, don't worry. And I took these from Tony Morita, so I want to give credit there. Number one, submit to governing authorities, acknowledging God's design for them, and thank God for all the good that is done through them. That's, that's real simple, right? So submit to governing authorities, acknowledging God's design for them, and thank God for all the good that is done through them. Number two, pray for those in leadership. Oh, that we would pray for our leaders more than we complain about our leaders. May we, as the people of God, be a people who are faithful to pray for our leaders no matter who they are. Number three, be a good citizen. Be a good citizen. Look for ways to be a good citizen. To, to live in a way that pleases the Lord. To live in a way that would commend the Gospel to our neighbors. Number four, seek the welfare of our community. Seek the welfare of our community. We talked about our relationship with Robert E. Lee Elementary. But I know that you're involved in various other uh, organizations and, and ministries and things in our community. And as followers of Jesus, we should be looking for ways to seek the welfare of our community. Number five, engage the political process with truth and justice and the common good in mind. And so you vote, you write letters to your leaders, you do all of those things with truth and justice and the common good in mind. Number six, if you are a civil leader, lead with biblical values and bring your convictions into the public arena. Don't think that you can separate your faith in Jesus from who you are as a leader. It's just not possible. You can't do that. And so if you're a civil leader, lead with biblical values. Bring your convictions into the public arena. Number seven, rest in the providence of God. When you look at our nation, when you look at our commonwealth, when you look at our community and things aren't going as you would like them to go, it maybe even feels like things are unraveling, things are falling apart, rest in the providence of God. Know that our God is still on His throne and He's worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our confidence. And number eight, make your ultimate allegiance to King Jesus. Your ultimate allegiance is to King Jesus. It's not to a political party. It's not to a politician. Our ultimate allegiance is to King Jesus, who rules and reigns on His throne forever. He alone came and gave His life to die to pay for our sin. He alone was raised from the grave three days later. He alone is our righteousness. And so our allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ.